In today's show, we look back at the five games from Thursday, some interesting results, some big performances. I go through my all-star selections. Obviously, there's going to be controversy. There's always, there always is. We talk about waiver wire trends and anything else we decide to get to. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com. And you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore Beeble, on TikTok at redrock underscore Beeble, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash LockedOnNBA. Thank you for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We are free and available on all platforms. We're going to talk news, as I said. I'm going to give my all-star rosters and just a disclaimer on them. I did them earlier today, and I'm looking back on them, and I'm going, oh, no. Like, I'm not sure. And there are definitely going to be omissions. And we'll see. We'll see when we get to it. But I, I look at it now and I go, oh, I don't, I don't know about that. Oh, I'm not sure about that. Oh, I'm not sure about that. But that's fine. That's how we go. Like that's 12 minute on all-star roster. Should be bigger. And there's going to be some discussions with some of these ones for sure. And you're going to hate some of the picks and you're going to be shocked at some of the picks, I think. Anyway, warning. Let's get it on, Gilly. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about some news. It's the day of the thumb. Mitchie Robinson is out for at least three weeks for thumb surgery. I'm going to give it four. Chrissy Wood is out for at least one week with a thumb issue. He might be 10 days, two weeks, I think, for him. Um, we've seen thumb injuries, time frame be all over the shop. We saw Sabonis miss a game. We saw Kevin Love miss a game. We see players miss six weeks. It's all over the place in terms of how long they're out for. So saying that they're, um, they're out at least three and at least one gives us more of an idea of the respective. They wouldn't say Wood's out at least one for him to be out four weeks, I wouldn't think. With Robinson out, I do think that Jericho Sims is probably going to be the better option over Isaiah Hartenstein, but I don't think that Hartenstein or Sims are must-roster 12-team league players. There is an opportunity, I guess, theoretically, for quickly to play more minutes, but how often do you think Thomas Thibodeau is going to run a lineup without a traditional center out there? And for quickly to get more minutes, that's what he would have to do. It would mean Randall or Toppen would have to play significant chunks of minutes at center to get quickly into the lineup more, and I just do not believe that Tom is going to do that. I think he's going to have Sims and Hartenstein there for 46, 45 minutes of the game at least. Maybe you get some Randall top and combinations. Maybe you get Barrett at the four, Randall at the five. But Thibodeau hates that, hates it. He'd rather play two stiff centers next to each other than play a lineup with no centers. That's just how he operates. So while there could be an opportunity, I guess, for more quickly, I just don't see it happening often enough to justify him at 34 minutes. Now, he still can be a 12-team league player. We saw him play 30 minutes last game. And he probably is on the fringes there. And I wouldn't rush to add Sims, and I wouldn't rush to add Hartenstein in this scenario. With Wood out, you're going to get more minutes for Powell. Do you actually get more touches for Finney Smith? Minutes are fine. He played 35 minutes last game, Dorian. Like, this is not the simple case of Wood's a high-usage player, so now Finney Smith becomes a high-usage player. What likely happens is Tim Hardaway, who's been out, gets back into the starting lineup next game and takes Wood's usage. And that's where it goes. It gets distributed that way. And Finney Smith doesn't get a gigantic bump. Um, Powell plays a few extra minutes. McGee gets a little bit off the off the bench. Reggie Bullock gets a few extra minutes. Maybe Josh Green does. And likely none of those guys are anything. Maybe Hardaway can be a 12-teamer. But Finney Smith and Bullock and Powell, they just become stream options for 12s. I wouldn't rush to really to grab anyone, surprisingly, with the news there of Mitch Robinson being out or Christian Wood. I wouldn't rush to add any of those players in 12-team leagues. We had Franz Wagner and Markel Fultz questionable. Fultz has actually since been upgraded off the injury report, so that's fine. If Franz is out, I think it opens up a great opportunity for a bold bowl stream because they're Friday, Saturday, back-to-back, and bowl would likely move into the lineup, I would guess, unless they put Jalen Suggs in there, pushing Gary Harris up to the three. In Atlanta, Young and Bogdanovich are both questionable. Um, so that is interesting. If they do miss, then you've got AJ Griffin, DeAndre Hunter, Aaron Holiday, but you know, I'd feel pretty disgusting about trying that. In a 12-team league, it's just something that is worth monitoring. And then in Milwaukee, Yanni is questionable. 
We don't have an update on Chris Middleton yet. I'm going to assume that Middleton doesn't play on Saturday, but we'll see. Yanni is officially questionable for Saturday. We'll get more of an update on Middleton tomorrow, but Yanni is questionable for that game on Saturday. Now, it is time for us to look at my picks for the All-Star breaks or the All-Star game. So five starters, seven bench players is how I did it, which is how the All-Star game does it. Um, one change that I made is that I did not include DeMar DeRozan as a guard because he hasn't played as a guard for four years. And I don't know why the NBA puts him as a guard. I don't think he's played a single second as a guard in Chicago. So that's ridiculous. So I kept him as a forward. And I'm looking at my... The starters don't matter that much. And I understand that this is not how things are going to work. This is not how the lineups are going to be decided. And I'm well aware of that. Right. I know who is going to be your vote voted with fan votes and co I, I know that. Right. But I tried to look at it through a number of lenses. I looked at their impact from just a, a subjective point of view, from me watching them and paying attention to every game of the season so far. I looked at a bunch of advanced stats and I didn't really go, well, this team is the second seed, therefore they need two players. I didn't look at it that way. But if there was tiebreakers and I thought, oh, I'm really debating between these players, I tended to go with a guy whose team and who he was contributing to their success a little bit more. That is that is how I went with it. And I still look at it and go, I'm not really sure. Yeah, dealing with guys who have been in and out with injuries is hard. No, absolutely no, like, de denying that. No debating that it is hard to do that. And I'm really interested to see, again, if you're looking at these all-star lineups, I beg you, before you say, where's X, tell me who you would take off to put X in. Now, I can see who you would in a lot of these situations, but tell me who you would take off if you are in the comments here before you tell me who you put on. Hey, and if you are here on YouTube, this is a great time. It's the mission to 60. Get me to 60,000 60, subs. So hit subscribe if you haven't already. We are about seven or eight, no, 800 away, I think, from hitting 60,000. So if you can hit that subscribe button, get me up to 60,000 before the All-Star break. Good for me. Good for you. Good for me. I hope. Let's get it. All right. Western Conference. God, I'm really nervous about revealing this because I look at them and I'm not confident with it at all. So let's do it. The Western Conference All-Stars for me here, January the 20th, about a month away from the game. My starters. Okay, let's go through the easy ones. Luka Doncic starting in the backcourt. If you debate that, you lost your mind. In the front court, Nikola Jokic. If you debate that, you're also insane. Okay, they're there. And then, it was a shit show. I didn't really know what to do with the others. In the backcourt, pairing with Luca, I went with Shea Gildas Alexander. He has played a lot this season. He has produced at a sensationally high level. He's played almost 1,500 minutes for the year, which is basically exactly the same as Doncic. He's like 50 minutes behind Doncic. He's played more minutes than Jokic. He's obviously played a lot more minutes than Steph, almost 500 more minutes. And I just think he's been that good. So I've got Shea starting next to Doncic. Next to Jokic, I've got Anthony Davis. And yes, Anthony Davis is currently injured. He should be back before the All-Star break. And if I had to pick these teams a little bit closer to the All-Star break, he would have missed even more minutes. But I think he has been, compared to the other forwards, like the one I debated putting in there was Larry Markkinen. I did debate putting Larry in there. But I think Davis's form was so, so good that I can't leave him off that spot. And even looking at that now, I go, well, but has he played enough, Josh? But I think that the level that he was playing at just put him a little bit above these other guys. And the last guy I put in as a starter, which I couldn't believe that I did it. I still can't believe that I put him there. And it's DeMontis Sabonis. Because I tried to pick holes in what he's done. I looked at his advanced numbers. They're unbelievable. Like his advanced numbers are through the roof. His Raptor, his... EPM, his EPM war, his LeBron, his LeBron war. It's all sky high, like top 12 in the NBA, top 10 in the NBA stuff. His team is what, fourth or third seed at the moment? He's been unbelievable. Yes, there are significant defensive concerns with him. Yes, I don't know how it all works in the playoffs, but he's been unbelievable. And he hasn't missed any time. He's played 1,400 plus minutes. I'm putting him there. Now, again, he's not going to make it in this spot. LeBron is going to start. And I think LeBron's been really good. But I thought LeBron struggled early in the season. I think he's had some struggles at times here carrying the load. What he's doing at eight, this is not a handicap race though. It's not, well, you're an all-star starter because you're 38. All right, what he's doing is unbelievable and all due respect, love it. And he's clearly on my team, LeBron. But my debate was between Sabonis, LeBron, and Markinen here as that third forward. And just Sabonis' team has been that much better. So I gave him the nod. Again, 
I look at it and go, oh, it, it feels dumb having LeBron not starting. And I understand LeBron is definitely going to start. And this is not a reflection of that. I understand he is going to start. There is no doubt in my mind at all, LeBron will start. But I do think it was worth recognizing the performance of Sabonis. My reserve guards, literally no argument here. Surely not. Jar and Steph. All right. Okay. Then you name three forwards. Well, Lowry and LeBron. LeBron's got to be in. marketing has been ridiculously good. Put them both there as well. I went with Jaron Jackson for the next spot. Yes, he did start the season with an injury and wasn't there to play to begin the year. But he has been that impactful that I don't think I could leave him off. Like I could have had in that other spot, Aaron Gordon, whose you know, team is obviously going really well, but so is Memphis. And I just think the impact that Jaron is having, it deserves recognition. So that's why I'm putting him right there. And my two wild cards, Damian Lillard and Paul George. Now you might say, Paul George, man, he's been soft. The Clippers are struggling. George has still been unbelievably good. He, is, he has actually still played over a thousand minutes. It's not a, it's not a terrible decrease. He's actually wrapped the war and his EPM estimated wins are actually really high despite playing low minutes. And I think he's been good enough to get it. Now, that is that is debatable. I could easily see Devin Booker in there, but Booker actually, the, well, the team is struggling as well. Booker's missed a ton of time. I, th- actually, I think he's actually missed more time than, um, yeah, he's played fewer minutes than Paul George. And I don't think he's been quite as impactful in those minutes as a totality. It, it was close though. That was probably the other guy that I was debating. I guess we could have chucked De'Aaron Fox in there. I don't think he's been really anywhere near as good as Sabonis, especially over the last, say, two months. At the start of the year, it was Fox, but it's it's been it's been now uh, Sabonis ever since then. And you know, I think Kawhi is obviously not in that mix. Um, yeah, Anthony Edwards isn't in that mix. Um, Zion was the one that I, that I was debating, but he's played so few minutes. His impact numbers aren't quite as good as some of these other guys. I could have had him in there. And I really, I'd actually typed Zion's name in there over Paul George and then did take it out. But Zion could have made it. I just think that the minutes there is a little bit of a concern to me um, overall. Um, So I didn't put him in. But that is, that's my take. Again, easily debatable. Booker, sure. Zion, no problem. Fox, maybe. I think Fox would be behind Zion and and uh, and, and Booker to me um, on that list. But that is my... Western Conference All-Stars. We'll get to the East in a second. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you know, success in 2023 depends on the team members you surround yourself with. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching open roles with people who have the skills, values, and experiences to help you achieve your goals. LinkedIn Jobs can help you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post, company, and their 875 million member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Oh boy. Let's do the East. <laughs> um, all right. Eastern Conference All-Stars. I've got in the backcourt Don Mitchell and Jim Harden. He's Don. He's good. I think what Harden's doing has been um, really underrated this season. I think he's been super impactful. He missed time to begin the year. But I don't know. I just think he's been very, very underrated in what he's done. He's had a better season than Kyrie. He's had a better season than Trey Young. I don't think really without too much debate. And I think he's been really like, unbelievably good. So I'm putting him there. And I, again, I, that you can debate it, but I don't really think it's worth debating. My starters in the forward section, Embiid, Durant, Tatum. Durant's probably not going to make it. Actually, I'll try again. Durant's probably not going to be healthy to play, but I think they, they should be the starters. Obviously, the guy missing out there is Yanni. And Yanni's season's probably been a little bit worse than those three players. So he doesn't make the starting group. My bench guards, Tyrese Halliburton, Jalen Brown. Again, I think that's very hard to debate. My bench forwards, Yanni, is in. Jim Butler, I think he's in. This one, I, I, I look at it still now, and I go, Josh, are you, are you actually, are you serious? I couldn't believe that I put 
Julius Randle in. I, I still can't believe that I did it. It's like, okay, the Knicks, they've been much better of late. They're really stepping it up. They're in the seventh seed. They're five games, four games over 500. Because surely, yeah, Jalen Brunson's the guy. And then I looked, and Randle's um, advanced numbers are miles ahead. Like, miles. Like, his EPM is a 6.9 versus 3.9 compared to Brunson. And that's too big of a difference. And as much as I don't like Randall's stylistic um, play, the way that, or the way that he plays at times, and there's just some... When he has a stinker, it stands out, like, unbelievably. The overwhelming advanced statistical evidence for Randall made me put him in. And I still can't believe that I did it. But here, here we are. Julius Randall in the All-Star team. I, I can't, I'm really... I can't. I still can't believe that I did it. My two wild cards, Demar Derozan. I think he's been really good. Yeah, you know, obviously the team's not going anywhere, but I think he's in there. And then lastly, I put in Porzingis. Porzingis. Again, he's been really good. He's been healthy. He's played a lot of games. Are the Wizards going anywhere? Not really, but their team is like yeah, he's they won one fewer game than the Raptors. And the other guy you could debate could have that spot would be Pascal Siakam, or maybe it's Ojan Anobi. Well, to be honest, you know who's else had a really good season? Franz Wagner's advanced metrics are through the roof, but you're not going to give it to him. Um, so I gave Puzingas the nod. Barely. Over, say, a Drew Holiday was the other one of the other names in that mix there. But I put him in. I don't think Trey Young's had a good enough season. I don't think DeJounte Murray has had a good enough season. Darius Garland was on the border for me. He was very, very close to getting in. I don't think Jared Allen's in that mix. I don't think Evan Mobley's in that mix. So I put Puzingas in as the final spot. And then I named it injury replacement because I don't think Durant's going to play. Um, and I think that would be Siakam. But there are a few other names that I, you know, like Garland that I just said um, that I could have thrown in there. I don't think Kuzma's in that zone. I don't think Levine's in that zone. Bam Adebayo, maybe. I don't think he's been as impactful this season. He's still been good. I don't think he's been as impactful. Um, so there you go. Mitchell, Harden, Embiid, Durant, Tatum, Halliburton, Jalen Brown, Giannis, Butler, Randall, DeRozan, Porzingis. And, you know, you might people might say things about the way that I'm biased about players. The fact that I've got... Julius Randle and DeMar DeRozan in my Eastern Conference team and I've got Sabonis in my Western Conference teams shows you that even though at times I shit on these guys a lot for some of the things that they do and their play style and their value, I think they've been good and they're good enough to get in. Is that enough to um, is that enough to quash the, uh, the rumors of me being biased? I don't know. We'll see. Let's talk about the waiver wire. That was so nerve-wracking to do those teams. The waiver wire, the most added players over the last 24 hours. Number one is Dennis Smith Jr. Yes, we add him. Uh, LaMelo Ball. We don't actually know whether he's going to be out, but I don't care. We add Dennis Smith. Straightforward stuff. Alex Caruso, the Rabbit Hunter, up 19%. Hmm. Keep we quiet. I'm hunting rabbits. Did it work out today? I don't know. He played like 22 minutes, but he had a million defensive stats and he's still coming off the bench behind Desumu. Someone said, hey, it's a challenge for Josh to tell us in a podcast or to not tell us that he doesn't like Ayo Desumu in, in, a, in a one show. Can Josh actually do the challenge? I'm going to do it today. Surprising the Crusoe came off the bench. I guess if you added him, it worked out. But I still don't know about it. Seth Curry up 9%, chasing a little bit with Kyrie back. We'll see. There's still streaming value and with a low volume slate, no problem. Anthony Lamb up 9%. Yeah, probably not. Um, Mark Williams up 7%. What I'm really interested to see here with Mark Williams... Oh, hi, Mark. ...is if he has a stinker next game, does that drop by 7%? Because did people pick him up... Did they pick him up because he had a huge game last time out? Or did they pick him up with the intention to stash for two and a half weeks, three weeks? Because if they picked him up thinking, oh, he's just going to do what he did last game, every game, 17 minutes, he's going to have a double-double with three blocks. Then they're kidding themselves. So I'll be very interested to see that when he has a, a, a five and two game, where the what the roster percentage looks like. Dante DiVincenzo up 7%. I guess that's a low volume stream. Same with Damian Lee, who did get the start for Phoenix today. And then Pat Williams. These are all good streams for the Thursday. Most drop players. Terrence Mann, I get it. He didn't play very well yesterday. Totally okay with moving on from him in that scenario. I think he's still okay to hold, but if you want to drop him, no worries. Gabe Vincent down 22. Bye-bye, Gabe. Dan Gafford down 18%. Totally fine to drop him with the way the minutes are trending there in Washington. Dennis Schroeder down 15%. See you later, my, my guy. Tom Bryant, down 13%. Yep, absolutely. Goodbye. Useless, terrible defender, losing minutes. Tim Hardaway is the interesting one. He's been out the last two games, but he's going to return. And I do think he's going to take on usage with Tim, with uh, Christian Wood out. So I probably wouldn't have dropped him, but I guess most of those drops happened before the Wood news. Tyus Jones down 12%. Yeah. And I get this question. I legitimately get it three times a day. Hey, Josh, what are you doing with Jalen Suggs? Are you dropping Jalen Suggs? Are you still holding? I feel like I've said it 35 times in the last four weeks. No. 
I'm not holding Jalen Suggs in 10 or 12 team leagues. Yes, you can absolutely drop him. I wouldn't have added him when he came back from injury. I like Jalen Suggs. I think he's got a solid future, but he's no way a 12 team league player. And I've said this for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I get it every single I don't if are people taking the piss, maybe they are. I don't know why I get this question every single day. But let's I'm not I refuse to answer any more Jalen Suggs questions about do I drop him at this point? This is the definitive Jalen Suggs answer. The JCU, the Jalen Cinematic Universe, the canonical answer. Yes, you drop him. You don't need to hold him in a 12 team league. I'm glad people did it. Today's episode is brought to you by Built Bar. I've gone 20 minutes in this show without even talking about one of the games from Thursday. Maybe I need a Built Bar to get my energy levels back. I need it high in protein. I need it low in sugar. I need it low in fat and low in calories. And that's exactly what a big fella Built Bar does deliver. These are just like 130 calories, but with 17 grams of protein. And the secret to their taste, it's covered in 100% real chocolate. Don't tell anybody though, but that's the secret. 100% real chocolate. We all love a delicious treat. We all love high protein. And that's what Built delivers. And when you're looking for Built Bars, go find your nearest Walmart. I'm told they're everywhere. So go find one and you stroll down to the pharmacy department and you go down there and go, yo, farmer, where are the Bilts? And he points you in the direction and you go over there, you drop to the floor, you give 10 push-ups, and then you load them up and you just carry them out because you're so jacked. You can carry about 30 of these four bar boxes. They come in cookies and cream in double chocolate and coconut puff. And then you go stub them into your car and you go, I'm on my way to Sam's Club because I know they've got the big fellas, the 13 bar boxes, which come in the churro flavor and the brownie batter flavor. So go get those boxes from Walmart. You can also still do it at built.com. Don't get me wrong. Built.com still exists. But you can go to Walmart and you can go to Sam's Club to get your built bars. Built bar is built different. Now, finally, let's look at some games. This game was in Paris. It was between Chicago and Detroit, and the Bulls win, 126-108. DeRozan returned from a groin strain, played 38 minutes in a 20-point victory. Cool. 26-9, five assists, two steals, and a block. It's just a very, very strong performance from DeRozan, while the skater boy, Zach Levine, he dropped in 30 points. His efficiency was elite as well, while Pat Williams really liked Pat Williams' game, despite scoring only 10 points. Two for two, two, two. Yeah, because he had two threes, two rebounds. Oh, sorry, two threes, two assists, two steals, two blocks. Is he a must roster player? I don't believe so. But he's always going to be in the streaming discussions for us. Vooch, with the Rosen back, dropped off a little bit, 16, 15, and 6. And we talked already, I teased it, that Alex Crusoe was good. Now, he started off looking at his line. He had two points. What did Josh... I know you lost your mind because you put Julius Randle and DeMontis Sabonis into questionable positions in your all-star teams. But two points is not good. Ah, contraire. Three assists, four steals, and three blocks. Just absolutely dominating on the defensive side of things. He's a great streamer for steals. We know this. 28 minutes a night would make him a 12-team must roster, but he's not getting them. Because Dasumu starting and playing 25 minutes and putting up a really strong 13 points on 75% shooting with very little else. And he, of course, is not even a 14-team league guy. The guy who lost out the most with DeRozan returning was Kobe White, who played uh, 17 minutes for just 10 points with two threes. Now, passport legend Jalen Duran returned. That's awesome. He returned to action after the ankle sprain. He returned to action after finding his passport. He was a team best plus five. And of course, he played the fewest minutes in the game uh, or on the team, 18 minutes. Now, he had 11 and 12 with a steal and two blocks on perfect 100% shooting. And he is a must roster player. But, old mate, numb nuts himself, Dwayne Casey, are we, are we honestly doing this again? Are we going to do this again where Duran is the backup to an inferior player? Are we going to do it again? Because Isaiah Stewart started at center, played 30 minutes. He had seven points on 10% shooting. You do a center, seven points. He did have 11 rebounds with no defensive stats. He was a terrible minus 23. And these guys did not share the court together for a single second. I am still considering Duran a must roster player, but I cannot lie to you. I am scared as shit that we're going to have Bay starting and Stewart starting at center while Duran gets 20 minutes of mop-up time, which would be insane. Dwayne, my guy, please don't do this. I actually think that the best fit for this team is Bay and Duran together. It's not Stewart. He's not a power forward. I'm sorry. He's also not a center. He's a nothing. He's a backup big. He's Montrez Harrell with a better defense, probably. That's what he is. So... But if we're going to go back to Bay and Stewart, it's really going to be annoying. We are monitoring this situation closely. Or does Bay go back to the bench? Look, Bay was okay. 16 and 9, three steals and a block, but he remains horribly inefficient and his role still remains up in the air. If you want to grab him in 12-10 leagues, by all means. 
I think he's a must roster 14 teamer and he's okay in 12s, but the role's still up in the air. Ivy had 16 points. Not much else though. Three rebounds, no defensive stats. The four assists are good. 12-team points league guy, not 12-team category league player. While Isaiah Livers, six points, 22 minutes. I like what Livers does, but it's not going to translate to fantasy. I spoke about Isaiah Stewart already. He is not a 12-team league player. In fact, can we jack him off? Get that garbage out of here! Is that you, Mr. Stewart? Well, who the hell else do you think it'd be? Get in here, you pair of flaming galahs. Yeah, you can. Killian Hayes. Do you want to know something? Killian Hayes shot 15%. And it was only the third worst shooting percentage in the game. Stewart and Burks both shot worse than Killian. Four points for Killian, but you know we like that he took 13 shots. We like that he had eight assists and two steals. For the love of God, do not drop Killian Hayes after this game. Do not drop Killian Hayes after this game. I sh- I'm going to get it tattooed right across the abdomen. Ben Cousins, such as lifestyle. Do not drop Killian Hayes. I know he shot 15%. Do not drop him, please. Bogdanovich had 25 points in his... Return to action as well. Next one. Warriors and the Celtics. Big, big developments here. The Warriors started Jordan Poole over, over Kevon Looney. And Steve Kerr said, yeah, we're going to do this moving forward. This is what our new lineup is. Now, I don't know what that means for tomorrow because Clay's going to be out. So does Looney step back in? Or do they start DiVincenzo and just keep going small? But this means that Poole goes from a 29, 30-minute player to a 34-minute player, I think. And it obviously takes Looney... Not quite out of streaming territory, but a lot of you were just holding him in 12-team leagues anyway, erroneously in my opinion, but surely this is an indication to move on. Let's start with Looney, who had two points in 20 minutes. He did have 12 boards, and that's sort of where his value has been coming from. But as a bench guy, I'm not interested. Steph played 43 minutes in the overtime game, 29, 4, and 7, three steals, two blocks. The shooting wasn't great, 36%, but we love the other stuff. While Draymond had 11, 13, and 9, and Clay, uh, while he fouled out, he had 24 points with two steals and a block. Some good numbers from Clay. As for Poole, 43 minutes. Unlucky from the percentage point of view, 40% on 25 attempts hurts, but 24, 6, and 4, 3 steals in 43 minutes. Give me those extra minutes for Paul, and the numbers should improve. We go still shooting poorly, 33 from the field and 63 from the line, but 20 points, 1 steal, and 4 blocks. His defensive numbers have been quite strong. The rebounds, remember the rebounds from Wiggins in the finals? I figured out how to rebound, guys. Don't worry, I know how to do it. He's like rebounding the exact same that he's done every season. So nothing actually changed there. Anthony Lamb had two points in 18 minutes. He played the field. They played in a short rotation, eight-man rotation in an overtime game. And Lamb only got 18 of them. It's a little bit worrying when Kaminga, Wiseman, Iguodala, Jermichael Green all come back. The Lamb, who was putting up some okay numbers, but he does not deserve to be rostered in as many 12-team leagues as he is. For the Celtics, we finally got the starting line back together. Smart, Brown, Tatum, Rob Williams, Horford. And that meant that Derek White played 17 minutes. Maximum Derek. He had one point on 0 of 6 shooting. Now, is it as dire as it seems? Well, maybe. But I did say that when they get this lineup together, I'm very worried about what happens with White, Brogdon, and Grant Williams. White played 17 minutes. Grant Williams played 13 minutes. Somehow, Brogdon played 36. Now, I look at all that and say, okay, Brogdon's not going to play 36 each night, which means White and Williams won't play 17 and 13. But they're all... Not 12-team league guys anymore. Now, that, that is really good from Brogdon. 14 points, 3-3, three, three, 7 rebounds, really solid. But I think what's going to happen, you're not, if you expect 12 and 17 from Williams and White at night, then that's fine, but I don't. I think they play 21-22 each, and that is like an extra 4 slash 9, 13 minutes that need to come from somewhere, and they probably come from Brogdon's 36, plus the 5 overtime minutes that he can lose out there as well. So I wouldn't look at this and go, this is Brogdon. It's a win for Brogdon. It's huge value moving forward. I think all of those guys become 12-team streamers at best. Rob Williams, 14 and 11 in 27 minutes. But how about Big Al Horford? 37 minutes, 20 and 10, two threes and three blocks. Now, I'd say he's a sell high, but no one's going to buy it. We know there's going to be the issues. They've got a back-to-back to start next week, so he's going to sit one of those games, which makes it annoying from a head-to-head perspective. And this was a game they really wanted to win, and they played him big minutes, and he played bloody well. But we know we can't rely upon this level of scoring from Horford, although his production recently has definitely stepped up. He's still not a top 100 player, but he's definitely stepped back up. We understand there's going to be big ebbs and flows in his overall production. Jason Tatum played the entire second half and all of overtime, 34, 19, and 6 with 4, 3. Shot poorly, but the production was strong. Well, Jalen Brown shot poorly, and the production was bad. JB, you've done it again. 16 and 9 on 33%, including 3 of 6 from the line, really, really hurts from Brown. And his percentages are always feeling like they're going to be something that holds him back. 
He can be an impactful player, but he's not as good fantasy-wise as you would think. Marcus Smart had 18, 5, and 4, three steals. Good numbers there. Well, Rock DJ, 14, 11. Good numbers from Roy Williams. And I feel like I might have already said that one, but that's fine. Let's go on to the next one. It is the Toronto Raptors and the Minnesota Timberwolves. This is the third game in a five-game week for the um, uh, for the Raptors. And they lost again with surprising rotation decisions. Chris Boucher, DMP City. He was not someone that I was interested in adding for the five-game week, nor was I interested in adding Precious Achua, although Achua's been better. And again, we are going to see at the end of the week, did the five-game week mean these guys were rosterable players? At the, this point, Boucher clearly no. Achua on the borderline. 40 minutes for Siakam, third time this week. 41 minutes, 13, 7, and 9. Not a great game. Efficiency, uh, not good. Van Vliet's been awesome. 24, 1, and 10. Two steals and a block. 36 minutes after having back spasms on Monday. And Scotland Barnes also riding a massive hot streak. 29, 8, and 5 with two steals. Now, the shooting, he's ridiculous. 73 from the field and 86 from the line. But since that real Nadir, where he was getting called out everywhere, he's been dominating. Well, not dominating, but he's been strong, Scotty Barnes. He's pushing back into the top 70 for the season. He's 31st over the last week. You like what he's doing. It is improving a lot. Ananobi had 15 and 8. Well, Gaz Trent, 18 points on 40%. It's just, it's the most, Gary, Gary Trent has the most Gary Trent lines ever. 18 points with two threes, two rebounds, no assists, two steals, and 40% shooting. You know what you're getting. It's points, it's threes, it's steals, it's dreadful rebounds, assists, and field goal percentage. He does it every single game, basically. And while the minutes are this strong, that's nice. Who could have possibly thought, honestly, if you are watching this or listening to this, think to yourself, did you know that Joe Wieskamp played for the Raptors? Did you think you'd get 12 Joe Wieskamp minutes while Boucher was a DMP? Or Malachi Flynn was a DMP? No. Or Coloco was a DMP? Nobody would have expected that. Wieskamp had nine points with three threes, and I honestly couldn't care less. Achua played 21 minutes. He had 11 and four with two blocks. Missed all four of his free throws. There's always something about this guy that for a category league that never makes any sense. There's always something shit else, like a bad free throws or a bad field goals or a lack of assists and threes and steals. He had 11 and four with two blocks. is not bad. But the destruction that he causes in some of these other areas just always brings him down. They've got a back-to-back Saturday, Sunday. I feel okay about using him in that. I don't feel super strong about it because he's not a great fantasy player. Like, for example, he's the 265th ranked player this season and 213th in points leagues. But that back-to-back gives him a little bit of an appeal. For the Raptors, still no Gobert, even though he's listed questionable for stupidity reasons. In this game, no Towns, of course. Um, D'Angelo Russell played much better. 25 points, 6 assists, 2 steals, and a block. While Kyle Anderson is just dominating. 20 and 10, 6 assists, 2 steals, and a block. The 89% shooting is not real, obviously, but you just keep rolling with him. You have to keep rostering him. Goose played 40 minutes. Anthony Edwards. I'm a bit worried about his hip. Like, the shooting's still not right. I'm worried that it's going to cost some time here, 31%. But you love 11 of 12 from the line. 23, 5, and 7 with three steals is a great overall line. And somehow, Jaden McDaniels played 37 minutes without fouling out. 18 and 7, four threes are still on a block. But speaking of fouling out, Nas Reed, the Wizard of Noz. He only played 22 minutes. He had three fouls in the first three minutes. So he got benched. Of course he did. Of course he got benched. Guess how many fouls he had in the rest of the game? Zero. So thank you again, Chris Finch, for fouling out your own player um, when he didn't foul out at all. Three fouls in three minutes, zero fouls in 19 minutes after that. He still had seven rebounds, two steals, and a block. It's not a complete disaster. And we just keep holding him until we hear that Gobert is back. Torian Prince, not a great night, 16 points there, while Jalen Noel had 13 in 18 minutes. He's very hot and cold, Noel. Always hard to trust, but always an option to stream when you're looking for points on a low-volume day like we had today. All right, let's do the next one. The Philadelphia 76ers go on the road. They beat the Blazers 105-95, the final score. Embiid was great again, 32-9 with three blocks. Harden was great again, 16-14. Sorry, sorry, 16-10-14. No defensive stats, but we love what he's been producing. They kept Melton, the wave pull into the starting lineup, and finally, we got good minutes. 30 minutes from Melton. Now, he scored five points on 20%, but he had two steals. He had a block. And the shooting is just historic, not historically, but it's just terribly low. This puts a spanner into the works. If he was going to start and play 21 minutes, I'd be like, yeah, look, no, what, what are we doing? We can't hold. If he's going to start and play 30 minutes, and I'd, he's not going to be a 20% shooter. Say he's instead a 45% shooter, then we're talking about you know, 10 points, three rebounds, two steals, a block. Now, usage and assist opportunities are going to be hard for him to come by while starting. So that makes it a little bit more iffy. I still think in a 10-team league, you move on. In a 12-team points league, you drop him. 
But now I've got an element of pause in a 12-team category league. Still probably think we're heading towards a drop, but I'm not fully there yet. And interestingly, he played more minutes than Tyrese Maxey. Tangles played 29 minutes, had 15, 2, and 2. 58 minutes, that's two straight games under 30 minutes. That's a little bit of a worry. Again, his value is in high minutes and very high shooting. And the high shooting was there, but the minutes aren't. So is he going to be a top 100 player? Starting to have some doubts. Toby Harris, 11 and 7, 1 steal, 1 3. This, this is the future that Obama promised. This is what I expected from Harris. Not these bullshit five block games and 10 assist games and 90% shooting that he's been doing to rub in my face. Still hold him, obviously, but let's see where it goes. PJ Tucker's the guy that missed out 19 minutes for him while they played more Melton and um, Maxi together. Guess what George Yang did? He did his thing. Three threes. This is what he is. He's an elite, elite three-point streamer. Not much else. In fact, nothing else. But he hit three threes. For the Blazers, there was no Gary Payton. He was probable for, before the game and they ruled him out. So that's not good. So what that meant is we got more minutes for Josh Hart. 35 of them. I wouldn't say that Josh Hart played well. Eight points on 33%. Seven rebounds and two assists. I was very much out on holding Josh Hart if he was going to continue to play 29, 30 minutes a night. And of course, he plays 35. So again, a little bit of a wrench into the plans. But I'm pretty sure that those minutes are because Peyton is out and also because Winslow is out. So again, if you want to move on from Josh Hart, what are you actually missing out on? He's not a top 100 player. In a points league, again, I don't really feel that you need to hold necessarily. But unless there's a pressing need to add somebody, I would like to hold and see what happens when Peyton returns again. Nurkic only 24 minutes, had some foul trouble. Of course, when you limit someone's minutes due to fouling, you effectively foul them out. He only had four points in this one, while Eubanks had six and six with a block. Eubanks remains a really good stream option for blocks. Good game from Jeremy Grant in terms of scoring, but no assists, no steals, no blocks, getting by on some good efficiency, while Simons didn't have efficiency. He had 16 points with only 40% shooting. That's like the same story for these guys. It feels like every game. Shaden Sharp was, was brutal. T two points in 21 minutes. Yikes. That is uh, pretty rough from old Shaden. Let's do the last game. The Suns win it. They were up big, and the Nets had like a fourth quarter comeback. Some might say it was a fake fourth quarter comeback, but anyway, they had a fourth quarter comeback. 117-112. Phoenix wins it despite all of their absences. Kyrie Irving was really bad until the last quarter where he was unbelievable. 39 minutes, 30 points, two triples, seven rebounds, seven assists, four steals, and two blocks. Just astonishing, an astonishing finish. I was trying to say astonishing and stunning. Astonishing. Uh, an astonishing finish to the game from Irving, who put up just big, big numbers. Old mate Nick Claxton was also brilliant. 20 and 11, a steal and three blocks. His season this year, we knew he'd be really good value, especially at the end of the draft process when Yahoo bumped into about 140. But I didn't see this. Like, I don't think anyone could have seen this. It, look, honestly, when I did my all-star teams, he was a name that I considered. He was in that mix. Went, oh, he's been really good. He's He's been ridiculously good. I think there's... I don't know if there's a little bit more in his offensive game. Look, he showed out a little bit here today with 20% usage, but maybe there's something extra in it. I don't know. Joe Harris had a good game. 32 minutes, 16 points, four threes. Again, highlighting how we cannot trust any of these players. Harris had a big game, two stinkers, and then a big game. You can't trust that. It's great to stream on a day like today. Well, Seth Curry. Seth Curry is probably firming as the major option, but I think it helps that Ben Simmons was out. Or Ben Simmons got ejected, sorry. Sorry. 16 points in 36 for Seth with four triples. It's fine to stream. But TJ Warren played inexplicably seven minutes. What? Were they holding TJ for the back-to-back -back tomorrow? Is he even going to play the back-to-back -back tomorrow? Like, I'd feel really comfortable dropping TJ Warren. Really comfortable. And what do you do with the Basmati man, Royce O'Neal? He had four points in 34 minutes. He shot horribly. He had four assists, but tomorrow he might have 18 points on 75% with seven assists, two steals, and two blocks. They all just... Yeah, Seth is probably establishing himself a little bit, but I don't feel good with Curry, Harris, O'Neal, and Warren. They're all just players. They're all just parts. They're all just guys that we move in and out, and nobody feels like they're establishing themselves as any sort of full-time replacement. As for Simmons, he had 7, 4, and 6. It looks really bad, but at the time of his ejection, he led the team in rebounds and assists and was the second leading scorer out of their starting group. He'd scored more points than Kyrie at that point. Um, so yeah, like it was the markings of a better game from him, but of course he got ejected and had five fouls before he was ejected. So the frustrations, um, mount, we'll see what happens with them tomorrow. But the Suns, Cam Johnson played 22 minutes in his return, 19 and six, a steal, two blocks, two threes. Amazing. Add him. Got to add him. 
He won't probably have 29 usage every game, but he's going to start really soon and be great. Mikhail Bridges, 42 minutes, 28 points, 9 assists. We love this for Mikhail. Now, the 9 assists aren't going to stick because Paul, Payne, Booker, Shamit, all out. And all those guys have ball handling responsibilities. But this was really, really strong for Bridges, who had a really poor stretch of games and picked it back up recently. Aiton started out on fire, then just couldn't hit a shot at all. 24 and 14, good overall numbers, but a little bit disappointing. And if Paul Shamit remain out, Saban Lee looks like a good option. 15, 3, and 6. He's clearly ahead of Dwayne Washington, who played six minutes. Lee was just really strong. He had a couple of bad moments towards the end, but he was really good. And Damian Lee was good too. 38 minutes, 16 points, and three threes. Lee is more of a streamer for points and threes. Sorry, Damian Lee is more of a streamer for points and threes. Saban Lee is more of an all-around option who, again, was pretty good in this game. We can very comfortably drop Dario Saric, who had seven points in eight minutes. We can very comfortably drop Tory Craig, who had two points in 25 minutes with Cam Johnson back. They're just not going to get enough to get it done in any 10 or 12 or 14 team leagues, I think. And Washington had six points in, sorry, zero points in six minutes. And if he can't get anything going while all four guards are out, then it's just never going to happen for him. Sorry, it's just never going to be a realistically long-term option for anybody, I don't think. The lines of the night. Your monstrous does go to Jason Tatum, barely ahead of Kyrie Irving. The waiver wire line of the night is Pat Williams. The young gun is Scott Barnes. And your dud of the night is maximum Derek White. The top 10 in category leagues, Jason Tatum at number one, followed by Kyrie, Steph, Van Vliet, Embiid, Lillard, Kyle Anderson, Scotty Barnes, D'Angelo Russell, Russell, and DeMar DeRozan. Your top 10 players rostered in under 50% of leagues. Number one was Pat Williams. He's definitely on the fringes. Good defensive stats. He's a solid streamer there. Joe Harris, we just talked about him and Seth Curry being sort of back and forward as points and threes type streamers in 12s. Saban Lee and Damian Lee, it's really going to depend on the status of someone like Landry Shamit and Chris Paul. If they're both back, we don't care. If they're both out, then we do care on both those guys. Hamadou Diallo was pretty good. I don't really care about that too much. Um, Jalen Noel, no. Derek Jones, no. Ayodesumu, no. These are all like 16 to 18 team league players. Kobe White struggled, but still managed to be the ninth best player. And then Joe Wieskamp at number 10. This is like real 30 team stuff. Your top 10 in points leagues. Number one was Jason Tatum, followed by Kyrie, Steph, Embiid, Lillard, Scott Barnes, Kyle Anderson, Nick Claxton, DeMar DeRozan, and Fred Van Vliet. Guys, that'll do it for me today. Don't forget to follow this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on the Odyssey app. And if you are here on YouTube, thumb it up and leave those comments down below. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.